and again, good morning and welcome to this, the 10th meeting of the Quality Human Rights uh, Committee um, of 2018. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are on silent and off the tables? Um, uh, and we accept apologies this morning for a colleague, Mary Fee, who's on other parliamentary business. Um, I'd like to welcome to committee this morning our advisor, uh, Murray, who's uh, going to be advising the committee on the work that we're doing on the Human Rights Inquiry. And I'm going to move on to Agenda Item 1. Agenda Item 1 is a decision on taking business in private. Our committee agreed to take Item 4 of today's agenda in private. Yeah. Um, um, before we move on to Agenda Item 2, because it's in relation to Agenda Item 2, can I ask our colleague Jamie Green to give us an update on the focus group visit to Leith on Monday? Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, guests. Uh, good morning to our advisor. Um, I just thought I'd give take this opportunity uh, at the outset of today's session to update you on my visit to Leith. We held uh, one of our, actually it was our first uh, focus group. Uh, uh, we're doing uh, a number of these across <coughs> Scotland uh, and we'd be, uh, in, in essence, we're meeting uh, members of the public, but also stakeholders from the third sector uh, and many other representatives of uh, a very wide range uh, of stakeholders across many different communities. Uh, the purpose of these focus groups is to uh, really listen to people on the ground uh, with regards to uh, what human rights and equalities means to them as part of the committee's inquiry. Uh, so the first session uh, we held in, in Leith in Edinburgh on this week on Monday, uh, in the morning we first visited uh, a uh, housing uh, Association uh, where they were doing some uh, redevelopment. Um, uh, these, uh, it's fair to say, were uh, historically quite dilapidated uh, and difficult housing uh, that people were living in. Uh, we saw some photographs of the conditions that people were living in and uh, I have to say it was, it was quite shocking uh, to me. So um, there's a lot of work being done there but it's fair to say that the work that's been done, uh, I, I believe, been financed by Edinburgh Council, uh, that none of this would be happening if it wasn't for the residents who'd really taken ownership of the issues that they were they're facing there um, and been very forceful and forthcoming with their views on this. And I think that's very important uh, to note. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that they believe that their human rights were being breached by the conditions they were living in, even in modern day Scotland in our capital city. And that was a very powerful testament to what human rights are on the ground, even in our own country. Uh, when much of the discussion is, is around what human rights are overseas. So uh, that was a, an excellent on the ground opportunity to go and visit and chat them. We were invited into their homes uh, and, and we got to get, have, have a good rummage around and see what work had been done and, and it was excellent. So uh, we then held a session in, in the local uh, community hall. Uh, there were a huge variety of stakeholders there. We were over 40 participants, uh, if, if, if I'm correct. Um, and that was covering a whole wide range of groups, everything from uh, the Sikh community, to the transgender community, uh, to uh, refugees, women's aid, um, uh, etc. And also individuals with uh, their own vested interests and, and what human rights means to them. And a lot of advocacy gr groups as well who work and help people who are often unable to help themselves. Uh, so uh, we had an excellent session really quizzing people as to what human rights means to them. And I think some of that will come out over the course of this morning's discussions, some of that feedback. Um, and it's fair to say that it was a real eye-opener as well. Um, it's, it's really touched home to us as parliamentarians um, what people's perceptions are of human rights outside in the, the real world, outside of this building. So uh, I think it was a, a good start. I very much look forward to the next couple of these focus groups. And I hope they will form a, an in integral part of the committee's work and actually listen to people on the ground rather than just pontificating as, as, as members do uh, in the chambers uh, and in here. So I think that was an excellent opportunity. I'd like to thank everyone who came uh, and thank all the staff who helped organise it and also the people who worked at the hall who looked after us so well. I had a great lunch. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a really excellent day. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity. Thanks, Jamie. And, and, um, and each of us are taking a turn in, in doing one of these events. And I think, as you can see from what Jamie has um, got from that event, we, we, sh we should um, you know, strive to get the same good uh, feedback as well. For this committee, it's always been stakeholders and people and real testimony. It's at the heart of what we do, uh, because that's where it matters and that's where it's, it's really interesting. But moving on to uh, the substantive part of our <coughs> committee this morning uh, in Agenda Item 2, <coughs> and it's our Human Rights Inquiry. And with us this morning, we have Dr Katie Boyle, who's a senior lecturer. School of Law at the University of Roehampton, and uh, Professor Kurt Mills, who's Professor of International Relations and Human Rights at the University of Dundee. Good morning, uh, 
uh, to both of you. Uh, Dr Boyle, I think you've got a bit of an overview of the work that, that you want to do, if we can hear from you first. And then, uh, Professor Mills, I think you've got a bit of an opening statement, and then we'll go to questions from, from the committee. So, Dr Boyle, if we could start with you. OK, thank you very much, um, convener, and thank you uh, to the committee for inviting us here today to, to speak with you about this. And can I just begin by saying um, how welcome it is that this inquiry is happening and commend the committee on the work that they're doing. Um, I, I was really, really encouraged to hear that you had extended your remit um, to include uh, human rights as well as equal uh, equality. And I think that um, you're showing great strides in terms of embracing the full uh, spectrum of rights um, in the work that you're doing. And, and, and really, that the, I, I should say, that in the context of everything that um, I speak about today, um, I recognise the fact that great work has been done um, in engaging with uh, the international human rights framework as well as statutory obligations and constitutional requirements in Scotland. So uh, thank you very much for, for having us here today to speak some more about what else Scotland might do and, and specifically what the Parliament might do. So I provided written evidence um, to support uh, what evidence I might speak about today. So I don't want to go into great detail, um, or speaking for a long time about this, what I would really um, encourage is if there's specific questions or more information that you would like, um, that you ask me to speak to that. Um, but just to give a very brief introduction and an overview um, of, of the evidence I've provided, it's really rudimentary in terms of just setting out the position as I see it and potential opportunities, both for the committee and for Parliament and for Scotland more widely. I'd welcome um, Jamie Green's comments about the work that's been done in Leith. Uh, it's a really important project and it demonstrates the power um, in people's own understandings of what their human rights are. And it also helps uh, for me to begin by speaking about the fact that we actually have um, a system which partially favours some types of rights over others. So I'm sure that in your work you've encountered that we have, you know, a very robust human rights framework in Scotland and the parliament, the government, um, the administrative sectors in Scotland um, and the judiciary already engage to a great degree with civil and political rights, predominantly under the Scotland Act and the Human Rights Act. And there is a division between what types of enforcement you have of those rights, depending on whether or not a matter is reserved or devolved. But beyond the civil and political rights and to some degree the socioeconomic rights that are caught by the ECHR in so far as it can do, uh, you know, capture a, a dynamic interpretation of civil and political rights, we also have obligations as a state under international law in relation to economic, social and cultural rights. And this is where I would see there is a particular account accountability gap. So when I speak about economic, social and cultural rights, I'm talking very broadly about a lot of areas actually that engaged with devolved competence, such as education, health, housing, social security, um, as it's now been partially devolved, uh, and also engaging, of course, with equality, which um, is a little bit more complex because of the, the reservation to equal opportunities under the Scotland Act. So when we see, for example, the residents in Leith, um, what they're faced with is trying to claim their rights under a system that doesn't necessarily recognise the full spectrum of rights, which can be very difficult if, for example, there's not enough capacity or knowledge to support an understanding of the full international human rights framework. Now, my evidence was to say that I think that the committee can take um, strides, and, and I would say that this inquiry in and of itself is a, a huge step and a very welcome one in considering how we could enhance the protection of human rights beyond those contained in the ECHR and also with a view to trying to mitigate against any loss of rights and remedies under EU law and that this should with, be with a view to look at economic, social and cultural rights. So the broad sort of headings in which I um, provided evidence was to say that the committee might take more steps in relation to participation and engagement um, through education mechanisms and also by um, taking the broad spectrum of human rights work um, beyond, the, beyond this committee to other work of the Parliament and also by considering whether or not it would be um, 
there would be opportunities to have um, a scrutiny, pre-legislative scrutiny, spe specifically within the committee in relation to um, civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. I also suggested that parliamentary procedure and process could reflect this um, and that there could be an embedded human rights scrutiny system um, across the parliament and I did very much welcome that idea and I, I mean I don't know how it might work in practice but this idea of having almost human rights rapporteurs which the committee convened to help advise across parliament in its work. Um, and I also suggested that there could be greater accountability um, in terms of um, the Parliament's role as a, in a constitutional sense is to hold the other arms of state to account. So to ask the government what steps it's taking to comply um, and promote human rights as well um, as um, reflecting on what the judiciary has to say about it as well. Um, and, and within this constitutional dialogue, I would see that that ought to be expanded beyond just the national level to engage with Council of Europe systems. And I understand that this, this is the, these steps have already been taken to some degree, um, and that you can engage also with UN mechanisms such as the Universal Periodic Review. So it's about expanding beyond the uh, across the committee, across the committees in Parliament, um, and then externally with. Um, National Council of Europe, uh, United Nations systems, in order to just create this very rich culture of human rights knowledge, capacity building and empowerment, so that people of Scotland can feel that they have access um, and can claim their rights across the broad spectrum of human rights. Uh, that's uh, excellent. Thanks, uh, doc, Dr Boyle. I uh, flew in last night from Strasbourg after three days at the plenary session of the Council of Europe where uh, we agreed a, a human rights handbook, um, and it's a handbook of good practice that would then be extended out to uh, local, national and regional um, uh, parliaments and assemblies across the wider context of the European Union, the Council of Europe being the 47 rather than the 28. So that was quite an interesting process um, because actually it looked like we were a wee bit further ahead than most of the rest. So that was quite uh, satisfying. But no, thank you for your evidence this morning. Professor Mills, if I can move on to you and for you to do your opening statement and then I've got a series of questions for my uh, committee <coughs> colleagues. <coughs> Professor Mills. Thank you. Thank you, honourable members, for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I apologise for not providing written testimony in advance of the hearing. Unfortunately, the invitation that did not provide me sufficient time to produce this, but I'm happy to provide my comments today in written form after the meeting. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be speaking with you today because almost exactly six years ago, I and a group of my students at the University of Glasgow, where I was teaching at the time, released a report entitled Scottish Parliament Committee's Perspective on Human Rights. This report was commissioned by the Cross-Party Group on Human Rights with a view to examining how all committees included human rights issues in their deliberations. While the report was limited in its time frame, it concluded that the evidence for the period of study reveals a widespread disregard of the normative and institutional framework for conceptualizing and analyzing human rights issues. Now, there was no evidence that this was deliberate for the most part. Rather, most committees did not seize the opportunity to imbue human rights in their respective field of activities. It called for mo moving human rights to the Equal Opportunities Committee and renaming the committee to reflect the new mandate. Now, although I'm not assigning any influence whatsoever to that one small report six years ago, I am nonetheless gratified that this suggestion has indeed been implemented. The creation of this committee represents a substantial commitment to embedding human rights in the work of the Scottish Parliament and Scotland more broadly. Now, I'm not a parliamentary or constitutional expert, most of my work focuses on how international institutions and other actors address human rights issues, frequently examining the domestic international interface. And so my comments for the most part will reflect this. Others will reflect on the intricacies of committee action and the constitutional mandates of the committee. I instead want to begin by re reiterating the potentially transformative nature of the creation of this committee and encourage you to use its potential to not only potentially scrutinize the work of other committees or to routinize the consideration of human rights throughout parliament, but also to use it as a platform to embed within broader Scottish society the positive values of human rights. Now, I have lived in Scotland for more than 13 years. In that time, it has been clear to me that Scotland as a whole appears to have a somewhat different approach to the issue of human rights than other parts of the UK. The open and welcoming response to Syrian refugees, for example, 
exemplifies this approach. The very positive words and actions on the part of the Scottish government and parla parliamentarians contribute to this. But this is obviously not uniform throughout society, and it is, it is subject to significant regression. We have seen this over a long period of time in Westminster with proposals to withdraw from the UN Refugee Convention, the European Convention and Court of Human Rights, and to replace the Human Rights Act with something which is sure to provide less than current human rights protections. This committee should be an outspoken positive voice against any such reductions in human rights protection, both in Scotland and in the UK as a whole, since any ch changes in Westminster will in inevitably have an effect in Scotland. Um, in, in this regard, I have a few specific recommendations. First, with regard to future proposals from Westminster, the, the committee must be vigilant in scrutinizing their effect on human rights protection in Scotland. This includes the effects of withdrawing from the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights as part of the withdrawal from the EU itself. Now, most of these rights are contained in other documents which will continue to apply to the UK and Scotland, but any reduction in protection should be clarified in plans to mitigate such reductions formulated. Second, there has been much discussion about and some political commitments to directly incorporating international human rights law, such as the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights into Scottish law. Direct incorporation to the extent possible would help to mitigate any attempts by Westminster to undermine protections in Scotland. The committee should be proactive in investigating these possibilities. Third, the committee can play a significant role in the development and scrutiny of the Scottish Government's submissions to the United Nations Universal Periodic Review of the UK. The most recent submission was robust and positive, but there is a role for continued engagement in this process, including considering the outcome of the review from the Human Rights Council and how the Scottish Parliament might respond. Fourth, and more broadly, the, com the committee can play a role in following up findings, reports, and recommendations from UN treaty bodies and evaluating the implications for human rights practice and protection in Scotland. It could potentially also send reports and representatives to treaty bodies. Fifth, the committee can proactively engage with international actors such as other parliaments and organizations to draw on best human rights practices globally to inform its work and the work of other committees. Sixth, the committee can initiate inquiries into specific human rights issues, including those which might span the domestic international divide or, or which may relate directly to reserve powers, but which nonetheless may have direct consequence for Scotland. For example, the conflict in Syria and the broader situation of refugees and migrants in the Mediterranean has direct impact on Scotland, given the open and generous response by Scotland to welcoming Syrian refugees. More generally, the UK's response to situations like Syria is of direct concern to many citizens in Scotland <coughs> who may not feel that their concerns are adequately represented in Westminster. The committee, the committee could thus become another voice within broader discussions in the UK regarding how to address key international challenges. Seventh, the committee can welcome and support initiatives to directly protect individuals from human rights violations internationally. This might include making strong statements in support of welcoming refugees. And it might mean engaging with initiatives like the Scottish Human Rights Defenders Fellowship, which is funded by the Scottish government and which will involve initially human rights defenders coming to the University of Dundee for a period of respite research and interaction with human rights organizations. I am sure that they would welcome the opportunity to speak with the committee and others in parliament about their concerns and providing such a forum would be an important show of solidarity. Finally, I, I appreciate the inclusion of academic voices in this discussion and would encourage the committee to continue to draw upon the very significant resources at Scottish universities and elsewhere to support its work. Now, I am currently spearheading an initiative to create the Scottish Centre for Human Rights, which would facilitate such interaction. But even in the absence of such a formal centre, there are many academics in Scotland willing and able to support the important work of the committee. In sum, I would encourage the committee to be proactive and mobilize public opinion in support of the broadest array of human rights, civil and political, as well as economic, social and cultural, and contribute to public discourse in Scotland and beyond on human rights issues. This may require thinking beyond narrow understandings of mandates which focus only on scrutinizing legislation to a more holistic understanding of positive support for human rights. Thank you.
Thank, thanks very much. Very comprehensive, uh, Professor Mills. I'm just going to go straight to questions because we do have two panels this morning and we do have limited time. So, um, straightforward questions, please, uh, Gail Ross. Thank you and good morning and thank you so much for such an in-depth introduction. Um, I think we, we can all agree that the, the remit now of the committee, including human rights, is something that probably should have happened long ago, but now that we have it here, we have to, to grasp um, the opportunity with both hands. And um, it's really important what Jamie was saying um, in his uh, discussion about the workshops that we were having. And I just wanted to, to touch on, um, I've, I've been doing a little bit of a straw poll when I've been going out and meeting constituents and asking them, what does human rights mean to you? And most of the time, their reply will be, well, human rights is something that happens to someone else. It's a, it's, it's a prisoner thing, or it's a refugee thing, or it's an international rights thing. So I was interested, um, Dr. Bill, to see that you had in your um, written evidence about what we can do to promote human rights uh, to society, as well as to the parliament, obviously, because the scrutiny of policies and, and other committees is um, going to be key in this as well. And you did make a number of suggestions about um, education campaigns and, and things. And I just wonder if you could expand a little bit on how we can promote human rights to everyone in society. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, and actually, I think education is a very important part. And so very straightforward ways of doing that would be to ensure, and, and I have to say, I, I don't have expertise in exactly what the school curriculum includes, but um, when I had a brief look over sort of the parliamentary material around citizenship, I couldn't see a great deal about how it engaged with rights also. So I think it's about almost reframing our understanding that to be a person, a human being living in Scotland comes with um, this um, constitutional framework as uh, you know, as citizens and uh, living together, that you also enjoy rights. Um, so it's almost letting people have ownership of that from as early an age as possible. And, and also just, I mean, again, across institutions um, and across all sectors, pu public and private, civil society, um, within the parliamentary institutions, but also in government and the judiciary, that we just keep a conversation going. And actually, I think Scotland does this very, very well anyway. We are engaged. We like to talk, you know. And, and, and a big part of human rights is that it's not top down. People's ownership over human rights comes when they feel they're included. So it's the, the, f the phrase that's used, nothing about us without us. And, and that's something I think very much that the Leith residents would understand. And, and you will all have worked within your constituencies with people that face really, really difficult situations. And they might not be caught by our particular legal framework in terms of helping them. So I think it's about revisiting exactly what country we want to live in and allowing people to have per ownership over that and creating a participatory, informed, inclusive, deliberative forum in which we can talk about where we want to go. And I think really that's what we want to We want to be enriching the dialogue that happens across all our institutions, all our public bodies and in and, and the private and public sphere about human rights. So I mean... That is a huge undertaking. It will take more than just the committee to do that. But I think the committee, in terms of making recommendations, that's the way it should be going and encouraging, um, encouraging that across society. Okay. Thank you. Professor Mills, do you have any? Um, just briefly, I, I mean, I, I think Katie was um, quite comprehensive there. Um, I, I would just... Um, Note the recent report from the Scottish Human Rights Commission on public understandings of human rights and, and say that I think this is a very important work which I think should be built upon and continued in some manner. I mean, if, if, if we get the center going, one of the things we intend to do is have a yearly report on this. But this is also something that I think this committee could support in various ways in terms of um, having more um, inquiries like this, in, in terms of um, asking for bits of research to be done in this area, supporting such research, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of capability out there amongst the universities and NGOs to do this. And um, I think a lot of appetite to continue with this work. OK, okay thanks very much. Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you for the opening comments. Very interesting. Um, uh, my <clears throat> my perception around the, following on from what Gil Ross is saying uh, around people's awareness of their own human rights 
uh, is an interesting one uh, based uh, on some of the discussions we've had with people. Um, I think people fall into one of two categories generally. The first is where they're very aware that something that they currently have or experience is then removed or lost and they feel that loss of human rights and they're only aware of, the f of that human right because it's been taken away or something's changed. And the other group of people are people who haven't had it all along but just simply weren't aware of it. An example of the people that we met in Leith where was a perfect example of where they were living in conditions which were clearly breaching <clears throat> human rights, uh, but they weren't aware of it. They just thought it was the status quo, or it was bad service, or it was a lack of, you're just accepting what they have. Uh, and I, th I, f I find that comparison very interesting. Uh, so I guess my, my question or my discussion point is, how do we raise awareness on the ground uh, that human rights affect every part of your daily life, whether it's access to education, health, housing, social care, uh, travel, access to the digital economy, and so on. It really touches so many different aspects of life uh, without talking in terms of charters and treaties and intergovernmental agencies and NGOs. People uh, that I met you know, aren't listening to those messages. What, what are the messages we should be getting out there? Sure. Um, that, that's a very interesting insight, and I think it's something that we see all around the world. It, it, it's certainly not unique to people in LEAF, and, and it, 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 it's something very hard to get at, um, because fre frequently the people in these situations don't have access to the types of information and resources and education where you start to understand um, uh, the fact that the situation is not right and and we can actually do something about it. And I think this is where supporting some of the excellent work from civil society organizations is, is, is absolutely key because they're the ones on the ground working with individuals and groups and, and community groups um, to try to get this message across that y you have rights and we don't have to talk about the European Convention on Human Rights or whatever to, to, to let people understand that they can assert themselves um, and, and, and ask for these rights. And, 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 and I think one of the things the committee could do is to, to proactively be open to accepting these assertions from individuals and groups. If I might just add there, um, I think it's really important and it's a very difficult thing to, um, to visit as society that there has to be a difference between recognising that people might not have full awareness of their rights and also recognising that our justice system doesn't facilitate access to accountability mechanisms when people's rights are violated. And that is a very difficult um, thing to face up to, but it's also a really important distinction because you can also say, well, we could increase awareness of the international human rights system in helping people claim rights. But if there is no access to justice mechanism that allows them to do that, then it's almost a futile exercise, not entirely. And I mean, I'm talking about, um, you know, it's so important to keep raising awareness and education is absolutely critical and that we have to have these conversations, but also recognise the fact that to say to someone, well, actually, this engages with the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, this engages with the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But at the end of the day, if that person then can't, in, in an institutional sense, engage with the local council and, and claim that as an actual legal right, then it doesn't necessarily result in any change. So there are many different ways in which we can improve our legal structure to better account for rights. And, and I think, well, it is critical that we raise awareness and help um, people have a greater awareness of the entire human rights framework to say to them, um, you know, if we start talking about um, housing or health or education in the context of, you know, in, in our structures which, which has EZHR rights, the EZHR rights might not do enough for people in those situations, and that's what's really difficult. Um, that, you know, if you don't reflect the full body of international human rights law, then it can actually be something um, which creates this, this accountability gap. And so there is a frustration there for people when they realise, well, I'm ought to, I ought to have access to better 
um, you know, housing um, or I, I, and and so I think there's a distinction to be drawn there between not just awareness raising but also creating the proper accountability mechanisms. Before Jamie comes back in, Dr Boyle, is, it, is there any examples that you've got? We, we like case studies. We like to see where it impacts on a real person and how that impact has impacted on the real person. Have you got any examples that you could give us? Um, I, Off the top of your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, at, at the end of the day, you can see, for example, people accessing their rights under the ECHR, for example. So Article 8... Um, is private and family life and to some extent housing as an example is captured by that such as the right not to be evicted but the right to adequate housing isn't necessarily captured by that so you may have um, we have quite, quite good statutory obligations uh, in Scotland which differs from um, housing obligations under uh, the law in England and Wales and so you might say for example perhaps that the statutory obligations be should be better pinned to international law so that it's very clear you could for example have the uh, uh, an increased regulatory function or inspection function that goes into parts of housing um, situations to say is this up to standard and those I could draw on many many examples comparatively speaking in terms of how this operates from my point of view, I always think that it's very important that Parliament takes the lead in providing rights, that the government and executive and administrative sections of society are where it's operationalised, and then as a means of last resort, if other institutions have failed, that you ought to be able to claim those rights in a court, and that should be an absolute means of last resort because it should already have been embedded earlier on. But I think it helps to embed it earlier on if you have this accountability mechanism as a means of last resort. So I'm happy to speak about comparative case law drawn from other countries if that would be helpful um, but as I say within our particular legal system you can only take ECHR rights for example so far um, uh, uh, because the treaty is not designed to capture the full spectrum of human rights uh, I, I, don't, I could speak a long time about other cases I don't want let, no, I'll let Jamie come back and finish his yeah, sure. question and, uh, and, and come to Alex next so that we've yeah. got you know quite a clear I think we all, we all know where we're, where we're yeah. going on this so so let's let's do that and we can come back Jamie thank, thank you uh, convener I, I think that's an important point that making that link uh, between the obligations that already exist in the international spheres versus what already exists in domestic law and statutory regulations, etc. And, and just to furnish it with some examples, I think it helps helps us. As, you know, we, we often have debates in, in Parliament when we're passing legislation uh, around the inclusion of things like statutory targets, whether they should be in or out. Uh, and and we, we often have political debates around that. Um, uh, but in effect, you know, things like class sizes in schools or waiting time targets for seeing specialists. And there's a whole bunch of metrics that I think already exist in policy, for example, uh, when one is in govern government. Um, but how that links back to the fact that if those targets are not met, uh, does that then interact in any way with any of the human rights uh, that, you have, that you're entitled to? And I think that link is very missing. Uh, at the moment. And uh, just a, another point that was made around people's interaction with their awareness uh, uh, or that sort of moment of, of, of realisation that the issue that they have is actually a human right issue. And I think the people that I noticed that, that we met on Monday were who were doing a lot of good work. There's the advocacy, advocacy and support groups. So people in their own communities will come together and help each other, that peer-to-peer -peer support. And at that point, they will then come across someone who has enough adequate knowledge of the subject to, to make that link back to human rights and say, well, actually, the situation you're facing is a human rights issue, and these are all the things that we can do to help. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll close just by not asking a question, making a, a, a comment, and that's on the way out of the session, somebody asked me a very difficult question, and they said, what do, what do I do if I think my human rights are being breached? Who do I speak to? And I pondered, and I didn't have an answer for them because in every other aspect of life, there's a phone number, there's a helpline, there's a group, there's an organisation, there's a government agency, there's, you know, there's an 0800 number you pick up and say, I, you know, something's not right. But when it comes to human rights, I did not have an answer for them. And I felt, I felt quite um, uh, ashamed almost in a way to say, I don't know who you speak to, who is that frontline person that you need to go and talk to if you think your human rights are being breached. Um, so if, if I can't answer that question, then there's clearly still a problem. 
wasn't a question, sorry. It was just, uh... <laughs> well, let's move on to Alex's questions then, and, and we, can, we can come back around. Alex. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. I'd like to cover two areas. The first uh, links into something you said, Dr Boyle, in your opening remarks about taking the work of this committee um, across the parliament and embedding a, a human rights scrutiny in every committee. Um, and to a certain extent, we've tried to do that on a small level in some ways before. And I'm thinking particularly things like child rights impact assessments on new bills, equalities impact assessments as well, of course. Um, that is is all very well and I think it's fair to say that there is goodwill across all the parties in the Parliament towards human rights. Um, there is a, a lot of political rhetoric about making rights real, but we know that on the ground in the implementation and the execution of these laws that often they are lost in the midst of everything else. And actually things like the child rights impact assessment um, become a, a tick box exercise and, and the rest of it. So my question to you is, I think you mentioned incorporation, Professor Mills, um, if we can't get this right just by by, uh, by voluntary action in terms of the, if we call it that, child rights impact assessment and the rest, is incorporation the, the way to give human rights a legal imperative and respect for those rights a legal imperative, both in the laws we pass and how they're delivered on the ground, particularly in local authorities? Okay. Um, um, on, on, on the issue of incorporation, um, I, I, I think so, but we also have to and let me put that comment in context, um, because we also have to recognize that the UK and Scotland already has many, many legal obligations. And, 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 and the Scottish Parliament is responsible for implementing many of those legal obligations that we already have already through the European Convention on Human Rights and other international um, covenants. I, I mentioned incorporation partially because um, so, some of these rights are not adequately incorporated within UK law, perhaps, but also to make it perhaps more real for the Scottish Parliament to say, regardless of anything else that's going on in anywhere else in the country, you know, this is something that's really important to us. And, and I, I, I think if you make that further commitment, that helps to, again, make it real and, and helps these these ideas and these these commitments to um, work their way down further into uh, um, other committees and other parts of parliamentary work, um, but this committee in particular, I think, needs need, need to be really proactive in making sure that actually happens. And um, there there's been discussion of human rights rapporteurs for the various committees and that sort of thing. And I I think that's really important so that there's somebody on each committee. That, that, that takes responsibility for making sure this happens and is a point person for this committee to engage with um, to make sure that it actually follows through all the way down. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, I think it touches upon really, really important issues because, um, you know, when we talk about um, what are essentially procedural duties to so you have a, a duty to carry out a process which happens to be to take into consideration the impact in relation to equality or human rights those obligations are process based and and actually we need to think about whether or not it is necessarily the best way or the most appropriate way or if there are other types of duties that you could impose so you could have a, a duty to have due regard, for example, to international law in particular areas, or you could have a duty to an actual substantive outcome. And you can see different constitutional arrangements around the world that have those different types of duties. Um, and we engage with them in many different respects. And I think it's important to note because a process duty may not necessarily relate result in a substantive human rights outcome or a substantive equality outcome. And so while it's a helpful step, um, it's important to recognise that perhaps some of the frustration with those types of duties is that the obligation isn't actually to reach a particular point, but to take something into consideration. Um, so I think that is a really, really important issue to, and to know, and it's worth further consideration about what kind of um, duties ought to be imposed. Um, and the other thing is about incorporation. Um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission are in the process of doing really important work on this, looking at incorporation models and also justiciability mechanisms for the broad range of international human rights law. Um, and I would just echo what uh, Professor Mills has said, that you know there is, 
there are many different ways that you can incorporate, and we do have partial incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights already. And you know, largely speaking, it 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 works in terms of ensuring that people comply with the European Convention of Human Rights. So there's a lot to be learned from that. And actually, comparatively speaking, in an international sense, people look to our example of incorporation of the ECHR as good practice. Um, so I think it's worthwhile exploring the options. I did mention in my evidence that it would be within um, the power of the committee, for example, to commence a committee bill that might look at something along those lines. Now, that's not to necessarily say that that might be, um, you know, there may be other first steps to take, but it is something that, that is there that you may want to take into consideration, um, even in terms of just helping out set in, set a set of instructions in, in terms of what would be expected. How should Parliament incorporate, and incorporate is such a wide term, um, you know, different types of rights. Um, I think it's really helpful to reflect on the examples of other countries, not necessarily to borrow from them directly. But if you look to Switzerland, for example, the cantonal uh, legislators, which are the devolved legislators, they are the legislators responsible for implementing international obligations. They are responsible for ensuring the state at the confederal level uh, is, is complying with its international obligations. So it's almost, you know, reflecting on the fact that perhaps if the devolved legislator took steps to implement international obligations through some form of incorporation that can take many different forms, it's actually helping the state comply with its international obligations. And so it's to, you know, the, the Scottish Parliament has the power to implement uh, and observe international obligations, including international human rights. Um, that's not necessarily a duty, but it is a devolved competence. So it's about, you know, to, to what extent do we want to utilise that, that particular power? And thank you for that. The, I think the key word there um, in, in your remarks um, just now was, for me, was just disability. And I think it answers, I think, Jamie Green's point to a certain degree. Where do I go when I feel my rights are being violated? And, and I think, you know, if we, we look at the various rapporteurs that come and look at our, how we're measuring up to the international treaties to which we are signatory, and we have six, seven hundred uh, concluding observations of things we must be doing better or could be doing better, that clearly we're falling short of those. And, and I think, for me, that's always been the lack of that legal imperative. There's no, nobody's going to sue you because they don't have a right to sue you. Um, I'll leave that for now. I want to, um, aware time is short, I'll move on to my second line of questioning, and that is political controversy acting as a barrier to making rights real. And there are certain areas um, where you have tensions between rights. I think the uh, physical punishment of children is an interesting one, because um, there is a, a view in some quarters that the rights of children and the right to family life clash there. Um, but uh, particularly, I, I want to ask about um, end-of-life issues, because of the, the, that's a really controversial issue, and politicians traditionally shy away from that. I think even on in an international basis, politicians shy away from that. There is, to my, my, my knowledge, no international human right to die. And I just wondered if you could give us a reflection on um, what we need to do to transcend those barriers, that political controversy that comes in and stops us taking the right decision because we're all worried about getting re-elected. Mm -hmm. um, is that okay? okay. Yeah. So I think, again, that hits on a really, really important um, issue and it, it's, it's one... Um, my... Um, in terms of um, my research, I would say that... Um, the way of potentially viewing what is very difficult and politically controversial issues in relation to human rights is to try and take one step back, and I think this is the Parliament's responsibility to a great degree, is to, and within this committee, and it seems very apparent that this is perhaps what is almost embodying the work and the ethos of the committee, is that you try and depoliticise what are human rights issues, because different um, political positions may have a different understanding of how to actually implement or realise a right, but I'm sure everyone in the room would agree that, you know, human rights violations and what you have all seen in relation to what may perhaps some constituents face is not acceptable. It's just a different means through which you would like to get to that end goal where there might be difference. So I think it's almost about trying to take a step back and depoliticise international human rights and its broader framework has gone through centuries of a dialectic process to get 
get to this realisation that we have some kind of understanding of human dignity as a basic component that we can all agree upon. And so it's almost about taking that and using it as legal standards rather than political aspirations or objectives. But I think as part of that, you also highlight a really important issue is that sometimes there is an incompossibility of rights where you may have rights that compete with each other. And actually, um, it is really important that, it, that there is space available for those dialogues also to still happen, like as you say, in relation to end of life issues, or where you have a, you know, a, 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 um, the, the, the comparison between um, the freedom of expression of one person um, and the privacy of another. You know, these are these are issues that we face all the time. So I think legally you can introduce um, tests to help balance between rights and proportionality, reasonableness, different approaches, and there's so much you could draw upon in that, that, that respect. But I would see probably the first step in terms of trying to create a space in which these difficult issues can be faced is to depoliticise and understand the legal standards as something that everybody can get round the table to, to agree upon. And um, I'll just say I think that's a really important point that w w we frequently look at how different human rights interact in, in sort of a mutually supporting way, but, but there are times, as has been pointed out, where there are real tensions. And, and the, the problem is that there may be real, um, real disagreements, fundamental disagreements between two people ab approaching, this, um, um, uh, approaching this tension between two rights. And is this purely political? Is it really fundamental and moral and, and does it get to something really substantial about how, how we think about the world and how we think about what rights we have? And, 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 and that's really difficult. And I study politics, so I don't think you can really take politics out of this, however much you have legal standards. Um, but I think it's important to have a, a committee like this that is um, committed to looking at what the law says and how we interpret that law and the multiple ways of interpreting that law and 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 acting in good faith to um, reconcile some of these differences. Um, I guess maybe I'm a cynic. I you can't get rid of the politics, but 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 you can set up situations and approaches that try to minimize the politics. Thank you. Yeah. Any bills? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much for that. Um, I was just sitting here thinking very much along the lines from the, the, the first sort of a questions as well. It's um, when you're looking at the two different human rights, so <clears throat> and they do sort of a you can't pull them apart. How then can we actually bring forward and say that everyone has human rights? and that your rights are your rights when sometimes they're not going to be your rights because the judicial, the judicial system or someone else's rights trumps yours. Um, so for me, it's like I've got a human right to privacy, but someone, just what you said. So how do we get that across, not just to, to, to colleagues in here, but to school children, to people in the communities and to the wider public that human rights is human rights, but sometimes there's got to be, there has got to be that sort of a comparison and um, we have to split them up because I don't know how I would feel having to deal with two, two people and having to decide whose, whose human rights was more important. Yeah, um, sorry, do you want no, to go? go ahead. Um, it's, uh, I think, just to clarify, when I say depoliticise, I think that we mean uh, we should be able to reach some kind of arrangement, for example, based on the concept of human dignity or something like that, and then the politics can fill in. And, you know, there has to be space for negotiation on different aspects of rights, but there should be some sort of minimum st uh, standards with a commitment to progressive realisation that is uh, that is viewed legally. Um, I, and when you talk about when rights clash, I think 
um, it is a really important point to note because I think when you, if for example in the context of educating, if you were saying to a child, you know, you have human rights, um, there are some rights which should be absolute, you know, nobody mm -hmm. should, for example, be subject to torture. Yeah. We can agree on that. You know, that's, so that's, a, that's what I would say, as a, then that's just a standard in place mm -hmm. that we can all agree upon. But there may be competing rights at times, and actually the way that I would explain that, for example, um, in a school situation would be to say, look, we also choose to live in a society together, which means that we need to share and that sometimes, you know, one person's right may be take precedence over another's. Yeah. And that's actually about community, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, so we almost need to step away from this private rights model of, uh -huh. you know, and, and reflect. And actually, that's that's perfectly reasonable to mm -hmm. that you may and actually uh, in making decisions have to have a view to what will impact the community as well as the individual and so I would reflect upon it in that sense that you know some rights are absolute but not all rights are mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to find a balance between rights the judiciary are very adapt at doing this they, mm -hmm. they do it already through proportionality um, but I mean ideally you shouldn't be going to have to go to court to get those decisions mm -hmm. all the time so it's about trying to embed it earlier on in decision making and balancing exercises are perfectly reasonable ways of doing that and I, I suppose I'm going to slightly contradict myself here <laughs> and, and, and say, yes, there, there may be competing rights and, and um, um, need to weigh different aspects of different rights. But at the same time, I think sometimes that's sort of overblown. And we have to be really, really careful mm -hmm. about asserting that, oh, the right to security is absolute, whatever we mean by that. And mm -hmm. frequently, we don't actually know what we mean by that. And, and so that trumps all these other things, like torture, like throwing people in jail mm -hmm. for weeks and months and years um, with no due course or, in, uh, uh, oh, um, or anything like that, be, because we say that this one thing trumps everything else. Mm -hmm. And we have to be really careful about those situations. David, have you got a quick question? Because Dr Boyle has to leave at quarter past, and we right. do have another panel. I've got panel, two very so quick ones, actually. Um, Professor Mills, you touched on it earlier about other committees within the Parliament. And like many of us on this committee here, we sit in other committees. Um, how do we incorporate that human rights into it? Because, take example, I sit in delegated powers. And when we take evidence or make decisions, I don't think anybody's ever says to us, have you checked the human rights there? So how do we really incorporate it in? Can you maybe expand on that a wee bit? Never <laughs> well, and I would, I, I guess I would ask, why not? Why is that question not raised? And, and, and why is there not somebody on that committee whose responsibility it is to ensure that, okay, while we're dealing with this particular set of issues, it interacts with this set of rights in the European Convention, the Human Rights Act, or whatever. Why are we not having this discussion? So I, I, um, I would say there should be somebody with that responsibility to raise that question specifically. Um, and, 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 and then you can go from there. I, I, I mean, I, I referred to the research that we did before, and, and I think part of the problem was that there was nobody who had that remit or mandate to actually ask that question. And if there was, um, I think that could go a long ways in ensuring that a lot of this these issues are actually considered appropriately um, from a human rights perspective um, across committees. And this committee could play a sort of overarching role to make sure that this process actually happens um, properly. I think David just gave you a job. Well, <laughs> the second question is, um, Brexit's a year away. Do you think human rights once the EU leave, uh, UK leaves the EU, do you think um, we'll keep pace with the European human rights or do you think it'll probably become diluted and maybe stagnate? I'm, I'm worried, um, partially because of Brexit and, and partially because of the way Brexit interacts with other things that we've been hearing from Westminster um, about um, how, how, how certain parties are, are approaching how we think about human rights, how, how, how we think about our international obligations and, and how we implement those and understand those international obligations um, domestically. Withdrawing from the EU will remove one level of pressure 
to um, uphold human rights. Now, for the moment, even after we leave the EU, we will still be um, parties to the European Convention and the European Court, um, although we know that there is also there are also moves afoot to undermine that too. And, and once we leave the EU, that may create momentum for further um, undermining of human rights protections. And so, yes, I'm worried. Dr. Boyle, you've got you've got 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and my apologies. I have to um, leave. Um, I have another commitment that I can get out of, yeah, yeah, so thank okay. you very much. But um, I just would echo that. I mean, I think the uh, First Minister has uh, taken steps to highlight the fact that it's important to mitigate against uh, Brexit. And I really, from a human rights perspective, I couldn't emphasise enough how important that is, because the body of um, EU law that engages with human rights is much broader than just to say the EU Charter of fundamental rights, all different parts of EU law engage with different aspects of rights, some of which be, go beyond what we already have. And even the existing rights, if you compare Article 47 um, in terms of accessing um, justice with Article, uh, Article 47 of the uh, EU Charter with the uh, uh, Article 6 of the ECHR, it's a much broader right um, which allows people to access justice more easily and, and, and if we remove those types of protections. Now the EU Continuity Bill takes steps as, you know, to mitigate against some of that, but when you remove yourself from a system you can, you know, you, it's not just the rights potentially that you lose but also the remedies. So you need to think also about the context of, you know, um, access to justice in that respect. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it is of grave concern and, and also in, in, in so far as um, one of the greatest loss in terms of um, exiting the EU is that we don't uh, we lose the potential of where that might go in terms of rights protections as well, um, and that's an important uh, point to, the, to to bear in mind as well. And it's it's a good point to to complete your evidence to us this morning, but you'll realise from our questions that we're no done with you, and we may come back and speak to you both again either through correspondence or at committee in order to pursue some of these these areas. This is our first opening salvo to this um, inquiry today, and we're really grateful because you've given us very clear lines that we, we can look at and lots of questions for our next panel who are sitting right behind you. <laughs> so I'm going to suspend committee for five minutes to allow for a quick comfort break and then back in your chairs because we've got another panel. Can I give our grateful thanks to both Dr Boyle and Professor Mills this morning, but as I say, we, we'll, we'll talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, and welcome back to the Equality Human Rights Committee and uh, our <coughs> continuation of agenda item two on an inquiry on human rights. And our second panel this morning with us, we have Carol Ewart, who is the Public Policy and Human Rights Consultant. Good morning, Carol. Um, Sanjita Hosali, who is the Director of the British Institute of Human Rights and someone well known to this committee now is Mary Snowden, who is the Coordinator of the Human Rights Consortium in Scotland. Uh, welcome to the committee this morning. We're very grateful that you gave up your time to come and you've given us some written evidence as well um, and have really helped us and pushed us along on this particular topic um, as far as the committee's work goes. You'll have heard the panel beforehand, which was uh, from uh, two very eminent academics who gave us some very clear understanding of where we should go and areas we should look at. I'm going to follow the same format this morning, so I don't know whether any of you have a brief opening statement. It would need to be very brief if you've got a few words you want to say about the overarching work that you do and where, where, where the focus of the committee could be. And Carol, I don't know if you want to kick off with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, convener. I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to this inquiry, um, which is, is very welcome. Um, as the agenda states, I'm a public policy and human rights consultant, and so I thought it was appropriate to tell the committee which clients I have just now, because you need to hear my words um, and understand where I'm coming from. Um, I have worked with over 120 organisations in my 20-year consultancy, um, but my current clients are Dignity in Dying, Voluntary Action Scotland, See Me, and the Scottish Council in Deafness. I'm also the convener of the Campaign for Freedom of Information in Scotland, and the committee has a copy of its submission. And one of the key conclusions that we drew from comparing the operation of freedom of information legislation with human rights legislation is the enforceability, the free enforceability of FOI rights. And that is what is the game changer. It's changed the culture of rights. It's increased people's understanding of their rights. People have more respect for their rights. And the crucial thing is that duty bearers understand their rights. And I was really intrigued by the evidence this morning because I think, for me, I would urge the committee to focus on the role of the duty bearer. There is absolutely no point in people knowing about their rights and trying to assert those rights if they are ignored, laughed off, or absolutely nothing happens. That's fundamentally disempowering. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Sanchita. Well, that is an excellent point for which um, for me to come in. Um, so I'm the director of the British Institute of Human Rights, and we work across the whole of the UK as a, a charity to really bring human rights to life. So what we do is focus on supporting people to know human rights, to use them in practice. So we work with duty bearers, we work with regulators, we work with individuals who hold rights and advocacy organisations. Um, and then actually to translate that story of the difference that human rights makes for people in their everyday lives into policy. Um, at various different levels. Um, so a big portion of, of the work that we do does actually focus on kind of actually how do you make duty bearers uh, be part of a culture of respect for human rights. Um, and Parliament has a really important role to play with that, so I'm really pleased to be here um, to give evidence today. But the other part of the work that we do is also international. So taking the voices of people, the evidence of people um, across the UK, and using that to influence international um, monitoring processes. And again, there's a real role and a real potential um, for parliamentarians in the international monitoring processes as well, because they're, they're not as visible as they could be. So there's a real um, opportunity there. So that's something that I'd like to draw on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, I think this inquiry comes at quite a crucial time for human rights in Scotland. I think with the context of Brexit that we've already heard, which takes away that framework um, that protects lots of rights and pushes them on, um, as well as that underlying kind of negative rhetoric that's often there around rights. Um, so they are at threat. So this is a really important time, I think, to look at not only just how Scotland can comply with human rights, but how we can progressively realise them. So to keep progressing them, what is the best way of the Parliament um, having a role in that? Um, I've obviously we've uh, put in uh, some joint evidence from um, 15 different organisations. So I'm not going to go over it, but just to highlight two particularly as particular aspects of that, because I think they've come out in other people's evidence as well. But around using the UN treaty recommendations and concluding observations, particularly the Universal Periodic Review, as a sort of structure for the committee to look at things, we were. Um, quite concerned with the last process that uh, it was positive that the Scottish Government 
uh, responded separately and they had some consultation with civil society. But there is this feeling of the recommendations come out, um, there's a sort of a response to them, and then there's not a lot done until the next time it comes round, and then you scrabble again to see what can you respond to this. So um, our members have talked a lot about it would be much better to create, make it a positive um, process uh, where you proactively look at the recommendations and see and actually implement them and then report on what's been done. So just to turn it on its head, it would be really useful. And actually, it's useful in the context of Brexit because to take that international framework and use that as a way to keep um, progressing on rights, it would be really positive for the committee. Um, and just one other aspect is that obviously key to all of this is is the participation <coughs> side, is making sure that you have the voices of different people influencing what you prioritise. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is actually, whilst very challenging, is extremely practical. It's just about building it into a work plan and making sure that you speak to different groups at different times and that the other committees do so also. Um, that a fundamental part of taking a human rights based approach is that listening um, and then letting that affect uh, your priorities. Just, okay. yeah. Thank, thanks, Mary. Uh, we're going to go with the same sort of a round of, of questioners, but the questions may be tailored slightly different. Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, you'll have heard some of the um, excellent evidence. I've got loads and loads of notes, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you all yeah. the questions that I've written down here. Um, I started off the uh, last session by just, um, just a broad overview of human rights. Um, when I go out and ask my constituents you know, in general, what do you think human rights are? And a lot of them will come back and say, well, human rights is something that happens to other people. It's to do with immigration and refugees and judicial rights. And and then, you know, you mentioned social economic rights to them and these, you know, civil political things. And they're like, all right, yeah, okay, that does apply to me. So, I mean, we do, we, we talk about the duty bearers and I, I'd like to come back to that as well. But how do we embed human rights in our society from the very early stages of life right through um, you know, all aspects because we are a committee now with a specific remit on human rights but it also crosses all the committees, all the portfolios, all aspects of life so how, how do we get into that, how do we do that with society? Get yeah, Carol. I, um, I think that's a really fundamental question and it, there, already a lot has been done. So I think the committee really needs to highlight and showcase best practice and urge replication. So one of the best things I've ever seen is a UNICEF's Rights Respecting School initiative. The difference it makes to children uh, addressing bullying, disrespectful behaviour from very early age, and that needs to be continued right the way through secondary school. I've been to presentations where children have explained moving from a rights-respecting primary school to a not officially rights-respecting secondary school and all the consequential problems that arise from that. So I think we need to celebrate the fact that there are solutions there. They need to be actually mandatory. Um, so I would say that first point. Secondly, um, when the Scottish Parliament set up the Scottish Commission for Human Rights, it departed from previous practice. It chose not to establish a commissioner. And so far, it's had about £12 million. And that's a huge amount of investment from this parliament, and it shows its commitment to human rights. One of the functions is education and training. And I think we really should reflect on, should it not actually be part of its core work, although it's independent, there is still the ability of the committee to influence its priorities. Should it not be a fundamental part of its work that there's free education and training to all 10,000 plus public bodies in Scotland and bodies delivering services of a public nature, that would change the culture, I would suggest, pretty dramatically. Um, and I think to echo that, I think one of the things, as, kind of, as Carol said, in terms of there is quite a lot of good practice already out there, and I think it's really important that uh, time and resources aren't spent replicating things that have, sorry, not replicating, but replicating kind of what do we need to do when there are solutions there. So we really need to make sure that we do know what the solutions are. And I do think one of the key problems are, uh, around this is actually the, the mechanisms that we have to enforce human rights. So how do they work? So yes, we do, there are commissions that we have, there are national commissions, there are committees actually, but how do you use your powers in a way that's going to push that forward? I think how do you kind of create 
a human rights culture from kind of society sort of from right from the start um, I think that's a huge question that lots of us are, are working on so actually can we come together how can we bring together the work that we're doing around that but I think fundamentally what are the powers of the committee that can drive that change forward um, and I think being clear about what you mean about human rights kind of what your the definitions are that you're using I think that education is really important and there's a huge role for the national human rights um, institutions around that there's a really big role for involvement and engagement of civil society in that process as well but to what extent do we see human rights as kind of part of our core business across the piece so to what extent is it in, in education so in schools but actually to what extent is it in our mandatory education for our professional qualifications so for social workers and nurses and teachers all of those um, all of those public officials who actually are responsible for making sure that people's rights are respected on a day-to-day -day basis and there's a huge proportion of what I spend my time doing is actually educating and working with um, working with those professionals and practitioners and it's great that we do that but actually that should be part of what it means to be a nurse it should be part of what it means to be a teacher or a doctor so I think really actually what can the committee do around driving forward kind of the practice space around human rights and really making sure that those who do have duties to respect them that it's part of their core business I think that's um, really useful because um, I think it's uh, easy in some ways to talk about the awareness of individuals and their rights but as has been said already sometimes there can be a frustration that actually I know what my rights are my UN rights but actually if that doesn't get you anywhere then there's there's a real frustration um, even recently I was being someone from a homelessness organization they were saying uh, you know that a homeless person has has certain rights and yet often it takes a letter threatening a judicial review to actually get them so I think there's something about the committee's role in making sure public authorities take on quite a positive uh, attitude towards human rights um, and that could be um, very practical things around for example the training of staff in public authorities one of the things that came up in the UPR uh, was around that and the Scottish government's response was largely that there is training in human rights for uh, police officers and prison officers but you know it goes much broader than that so I, I think training is uh, crucial and um, and the other aspect uh, is whether you have a role in terms of asking public authorities to come in before you once a year and ask them what are you doing to promote, to promote um, human rights how are you taking this into consideration it's very practical but it, it could uh, make a bit of a difference as well as um, some of the aspects that were touched on earlier on with incorporation and what that would look like and whether it comes together with uh, in terms of duties or reporting or what it is that accompanies that incorporation. Um, yeah, some very practical things that can be done to improve that, I think. The committee's written to local authorities asking them um, that, uh, you know, a, a, a list of issues that we, we have with local authorities and equality impact assessments and human rights assessments are one of my hobby horses. But one of the things that we have uh, pursued them on is on budgeting, mm -hmm. on a human rights budgeting process, because we, we've embarked on that since this committee started on the budget process here, you know, and really drilled into some key, clear um, uh, issues there. Uh, we've asked local authorities that if you're setting your budget, how do you ensure, you know, your budget meets a human rights standard, which is a very, very different budget process from the usual bus budget process processes. So that's that's one way that we're we're attempting to influence that. Yeah. Just, yeah and you know, I'm, I'm worried that your committee is going to be drenched with lots of public bodies appearing in front of it. And maybe the way to facilitate that is to focus on the regulators, mm -hmm. and particularly Audit Scotland, because you know it focuses on 200 of the biggest yeah. budget receiving public authorities in Scotland, yeah. um, and I think. Way back in 2007, we thought the Audit Scotland report, annual report was going to be a game changer because it had acknowledged that the Scottish Prison Service had set aside £85 million for the settlement of human rights cases, slopping out and other issues. And therefore, given that it's charged with the proper spend of the public pound, £85 million, in my opinion, is a complete waste of money. You should prevent human rights abuses, not start paying compensation once they've happened. Um, and I thought then they would change the regulation system to ensure that human rights compliance was central so that there wasn't a replication of the waste of public money. And it doesn't seem to me that that's really changed significantly how they go about the audit. So 
for the ease of the committee, it might be best if they focus on the regulators to see what they can do to mainstream human rights compliance in the routine regulatory process. Those invitations are in the post as part of this inquiry, Carol, so Excellent. be rest assured the regulators are on our, our radar. Um, Gail, if you want, do you, if you, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, that segues very nicely into uh, my two lines of questioning. One is on budget and finance and uh, public bodies' perceptions of human rights. And my fear is that whenever you mention those words to public bodies, uh, that, that what comes into their head is that the mention of human rights will somehow come with additional workload or casework or additional cost or require budget. And those are all very sensitive areas to public bodies in, in any discussion. So how do you, uh, on the suggestion, for example, that all public servants uh, uh, should have training, uh, and, and there are over 10,000 people, clearly that comes at a cost, etc. So how do we approach that negative perception of human rights within these bodies, knowing that there may be implications or consequences of, of, of being better at looking at those issues? I think human rights are seen as a problem, not as a solution. And I think part of that barrier is uh, addressed when you undertake education and training. Um, and I do think that we have to change the powers of the Scottish Human Rights Commission so that they do have the power to undertake casework and they do have the power to take test cases because the fear of litigation, you know, preying on that culture that currently operates, presumably would voluntarily change practice. And I do believe that there is a degree of complacency because, the, you know, human rights, it doesn't really matter because nobody's really going to enforce them. We don't have a culture of third sector organisations supporting their members or their service users to go to court in Scotland. We, we are not litigious. Um, so I do think there is a role for the Scottish Human Rights Commission in this regard. Um, and I think there are, there are two aspects to, to the question as well. I think that um, it's partly around actually kind of seeing human rights as, as a solution and yes there is an investment in training and education but every every profession every public body will have had some training at some point in their kind of in the career there will be some element of training for them to be able to do their job so it's about actually how do you integrate that into that process so it becomes part of the process and it doesn't become something extra that you end up having to do um, but it's also about the way that you educate and the way that you empower those public officials around you human rights and for them to understand what it is so um, in in the work that we do it's never it's never that now you're the human rights enforcer and now you've got to think about human rights on top of everything else that you do it's how does human rights help you do your job better um, and that's a really important message. And actually, once you do, once you're kind of in the door and you are having those conversations, we've seen really significant shifts in change, particularly working with um, staff in public authorities at frontline service level, who then have too often kind of are feeling the brunt of all of the difficulties um, around public service provision, but they're kind of actually more empowered to challenge up and to change things upwards. And actually, when it comes internally from those organisations, that's really... Um, that's really powerful. Um, but equally, in terms of budget, I think, as, as Carol said, the kind of setting aside £85 million to settle claims, a, a significant proportion of the public authorities I work with um, have brought us in to support their staff to do human rights as part of their job to prevent them from ending up in court because actually they're being smarter about the way that they think about their budget and their allocation. Um, and so it's not that they're finding extra money from somewhere. They're kind of actually saying, well, rather than allocate this amount of money because we're going to end up in court, we're investing it to take a preventative approach. Um, and we really talk, we often talk about human rights as being about prevention and prevention is better than cure. Um, and actually kind of doing a bit of smart budgeting around that when you're looking at finance. It strikes me that it's similar uh, when you look at the other committees in the Parliament as well, that actually human rights shouldn't be seen as an additional mm -hmm. burden or an additional thing they've got to take on, but actually a, a framework for making their work smarter, say, and, and better, so they have a framework for the questions to ask and the... Um, yeah, the way to look at different issues and make sure that you take into consideration uh, the impact on different communities. Um, yeah. that, that leads perfectly into my, my short second question, and that's around how we as a parliament and as committees um, uh, scrutinise whether or not human rights is at the heart of how we 
script how we pass legislation, in essence, um, because there is a difference between Parliament and government. And Parliament has a duty to hold the government to account. Now, we work on the assumption that uh, whilst it's, it is important that we, 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 we talk about Brexit and the, the long-term wider implications and the bigger picture uh, of, of that, but there are things we could do t today, uh, notwithstanding the bigger picture, that as a part we have a duty and a daily responsibility to, uh, to hold the government ministers, the government of the day to account in the way that we, we pass bills, the way that we, uh, we approach amendments to, to legislation and uh, through the, its various stages. What can we better do as committees in the parliament and as parliamentarians to, to ensure that across all the devolved competencies where human rights interact, as they do currently, that the, that the government itself is on track to, to put human rights and, and equalities at the heart of, of what it's doing. I think that's, that's uh, you know, I'm looking for some practical suggestions, perhaps. In the evidence of the campaign for freedom of information in Scotland, we highlight the importance of MSPs being able to exercise their Article 10 rights under the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the right to form an opinion by receiving and imparting information. And currently, we do not think the information MSPs have in respect of human rights implications about a bill or in respect of an inquiry is sufficient. And what you get is a, an edited summary of the legal advice that has been given to the Parliament. Now, I'm not talking about the legal advice that's been given to the government when they bring the bill, because separately the Parliament has got legal advice and you don't, you don't see that currently. I also think the changes um, have to be instigated around processes that the Scottish Parliament, uh, as a corporate body, has to provide better briefings to MSPs about jurisprudence. Um, of the European Court, but also other um, courts like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The reason I particularly like that one is because they've been very clear about um, access to information as a human right, and that was um, a very groundbreaking decision, so we've got a lot to learn from other jurisdictions. Um, I also think that when uh, budgets are set, well, although the Scottish Government may choose not to attach a condition to the budget of ind individual public bodies or bodies delivering services of a public nature, the Parliament should do so, that there is an explicit compliance with human rights law. And I mean that in the broadest sense, because under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, governments have a progressive, well, a duty to progressively realise to the maximum extent of their available resources, the rights contained in it. And so the budget process is a way to give that effect. Um, I think for the in terms of the parliamentary kind of process, that's one issue, but parliamentarians, the, the same point holds true, is that if we're expecting our public authorities and the staff in public authorities to know what human rights are and to actually use them and act on them in their day-to-day -day basis, then we should also expect the same for parliamentarians. Um, and where does human rights come in, in induction, kind of actually when you become sort of a member of parliament, where where is human rights as part of that process? Um, so I think there's the general kind of awareness, what are the opportunities for ongoing kind of keeping up knowledge as kind of, as Carol said, the briefings, but are there other opportunities that happen that actually human rights could be integrated into part of that to make sure that parliamentarians are aware of human rights? Um, because we're again, otherwise expecting parliamentarians to be uh, passing human rights compliant legislation or to provide human rights scrutiny in debates without the foundation necessarily of knowing and, and being able to do that. So we need to make sure that that's in place. I think having kind of specific committees is really important, but what's the role of the other committees as well? So when the other committees are looking at issues, how are we making sure that expertise that is developed within this committee is also shared with those other committees? Um, and is that a formal process? Is it an informal process? Kind of how, how does that happen? Um, is there a way to use powers jointly, kind of to undertake work jointly where it's required? So I think that there's also some, um, there's some real opportunities to think about how making sure human rights doesn't become just the job of this committee, but becomes the job of all of the committees. I think that tension is always there, isn't it, between um, you want to mainstream something yeah. and embed it across, and yet you also need um, some expertise and some people with specific responsibility yeah. pushing it on. And I think, um, so ideally, you'd have a situation where all the committees are taking on board human rights in, in all that they do in terms oh. of their scrutiny of legislation and their inquiries. Um, <laughs> but. We had quite a discussion actually between consortium members about uh, what we thought was kind of a, a good models around this, and and there, 
There wasn't, um, to be honest, a firm conclusion apart from that's what you want to aim for, is that mainstream ag across the board. And what that might look like in the meantime is the things like the human rights rapporteurs on, mm -hmm. on committees to make sure it's raised, um, whether they can have specific evidence session within each um, uh, scrutiny of legislation that specifically uh, questions the human rights aspects. Um, and there's about the information that they have, whether it's the, the policy memorandum beforehand mm -hmm. about compliance being much broader and um, including more in it. Um, so I think there's there's different roles, but the, the role of this committee in uh, with working with the other committees and ensuring, making sure that they take on board human rights and what they do, um, I think is, is really important. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Alex Goldhamilton. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thanks for coming to see us. Um, my line of questioning, my first line of questioning, stems very nicely from Jamie's last one, and that yeah, I think you've eloquently answered the need to and ways to embed rights scrutiny across the Parliament, and I'm sure others will pick that up. But I think it's when it's implemented in the field that it falls down. And we have a lot of rhetoric and goodwill across all the benches around rights in this Parliament. The example I always use is children's rights, and I've worked with two of you at least on this very area. In 2012, we had the introduction of the Rights of Children and Young People Bill. It was meant to be a really groundbreaking um, bill for the... well does what it says on the tin. and um, That was then conflated into the wider Children and Young People Act and became a very small part of that act. And we went from having due regard to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to having a duty to raise awareness of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. All, uh, you know, welcome as that was, that was then met on implementation um, with the rollback row of uh, and the reduction by half of children's rights offices in local authorities. So actually rendered completely meaningless by action um, from the original political will and rhetoric behind it. So my question is the same to the panel. Um, do we need to get tough on this? Do we need to give it a legal imperative, give um, not just children, but any recipients of human rights access to justice when those rights are violated, and is the only way to do that through incorporation of the various treaties into into Scots law. Um, can I, I, th I think incorporation is crucial. I think we should definitely be aiming for it, and we should properly explore the different models of doing that. Incorporation is not just one concept, but there are different ways of doing that. Um, and the discussion is already going on, looking at what that might look like. Um, I would also say it's not a panacea in itself. I think it needs to be accompanied by, you say, by um, access to justice um, and by... Um, even when cases are taken to court, by the messages from that being communicated properly so that that is well known about. So one of the um, bits, pieces of work that we are doing at the moment is looking around how organisations can use litigation, can press forward rights in the courts. Not, not creating anything new, but just saying these are the rights that people have and, and using the courts to highlight them and to clarify them. Um, but that doesn't happen often in Scotland, I think, as Carol said earlier on. There's not, uh, for many different reasons, there's maybe not a culture of it and some of the practical um, barriers to that. But there is, um, I think that should happen more. I think we need to look at access to justice, whether within this inquiry, but something bigger, because that is a crucial element of, pe of those rights being made real. And a crucial element, I think, of when there are cases in court, that then does change public authorities' actions. There's, there's no doubt about it that you need to have uh, both the, the carrot and the, the positiveness, but you also need to have the push from the, the courts to make it real. Um, yeah. um, I think incorporation is an ideal, but I would prefer to see the energies and expertise of this committee invested into making sure that the public sector comply with their existing legal duties at, in tandem with enabling people organisations to assert and enforce their rights. And again, just to emphasise the experience of FOI law is the enforceability of rights is what makes the law strong. Um, and you know, it provides a great model, FOI. You, know, you, can free, you get free advice from the Scottish Information Commissioner's Office. There's a huge range of free materials on their website. You can phone them up. And then when you actually make a complaint to the Information Commissioner, that's all free too. And if it was something simple like that for human rights, I think it would be a game changer. And there's nothing to stop you looking at incorporation in the longer term. But I actually think you're creating expectations 
that cannot be delivered within the colour, current culture and practice in Scotland. And, you know, com coming back to the point you made about children's <coughs> rights officers, Alex, you know, y you um, and other committee members have a fine track record in standing up for rights. But the difficulty is the day-to-day -day practical experience of people. And I think that is where I would really like the committee's attention to be focused on making those community differences. I would completely agree with that. I think that um, incorporation is where we should be, um, that that's the point of having those standards, is that they're supposed to be part of our domestic laws and how we work and how we function as a society. But I think one of the risks with focus on incorporation is that we miss actually the enforcement that we need already with the standards that we have. So if we're looking for incorporation to um, kind of boost the rights that we already have, that's great. But if we're also saying that the rights that we already have aren't being implemented and enforced sufficiently, then that's, as kind of Carol said, it's going to create kind of a level of expectation. Um, so I think that it's probably more challenging to focus on how you secure the day-to-day -day implementation of what we do have. But part of that culture, um, of developing that culture, of actually having the rights and then having the ways of enforcing them through court action is really important. Um, and I know kind of from my experience in the English and Welsh context, kind of actually litigation can really help drive through change. So it's strategic litigation is incredibly important. Um, but equally, it's not the only answer. Um, and so it has to be kind of actually what are the other mechanisms that could could be looked at, um, and as, as Carol said, the kind of the freedom of information model is really um, interesting. What do we have, kind of comparatively, for human rights? What are the powers of the Commission, um, and actually, do they have sufficient powers to make sure that that can happen? And then, what is also the role? If you're saying that actually, kind of after um, after measures have been passed, then the implementation kind of actually is really poor. Well, what's the role of the committee looking post? kind of legislation, kind of post-legislative scrutiny, actually, and revisiting some of those really key human rights uh, kind of bills or acts or, or whichever kind of, of, of pieces of legislation you were looking at, those which you have identified as a priority that you've worked on, then you've got a piece of law. And then actually, is it worth going back and looking at how that has or hasn't been implemented? There are kind of some models for having done that in the Westminster Parliament, which has been quite useful. And um, so also thinking actually kind of specifically what the powers and functions of the committee are, as well as supporting to drive change through other kind of processes and mechanisms. Is there a way that the committee could also be looking at implementation kind of par beyond the scrutiny um, point? That's incredibly useful. Thank you. Um, my second question uh, is, is similar to the one I asked um, the previous panel, which is that there is a political anxiety which creeps in and gets in the way of making rights real and doing what we should be doing in respect of human rights. That can be whether, whether it exists a tension. So, for example, in terms of um, extending equal protection to children from physical punishment and the views, or I think, distorted views of some people who regard the right to family life as incompatible with that. Um, and uh, and so, so there's that tension, but there's also uh, political controversy that sometimes if you grapple with a particular issue, and I'm thinking particularly around end-of-life care issues, that there will be a storm in the press or in, in public... Uh, wider society, which will see politicians carry away from doing the right thing. Um, in your experience, other countries have transcended this. Uh, are there ways in which we can enable politicians to take those tough decisions? Is that through free votes in Parliament? Is it through um, honest conversations with journalists offline about how to report these discussions? Over to you. Um, well... Big question. I have long been associated with the campaign to end the physical punishment of children and I still recall in 2003 being mortified that the then Scottish Parliament passed a defence of justifiable assault on children and that was um, the politician's idea of doing the right thing and listening to what seemed to me a minority group that was very vocal. So I do think um, all these years later we're in a much better position now than what we were then. Um, because round about the same time, when the Scottish Commissioner for Human Rights Bill was going through, the bill made uh, parliamentary history as being the first bill that the committee could not endorse the general principles of the bill, because it was said at that time that in a country such as Scotland, where abuses of human rights are so rare, do we really need an independent human rights commission? Now, reflect now where we are in the conversation we're having today. 
And so to answer your question, I think um, understanding human rights is a way to navigate the more controversial issues. We support dignity in life, so we should support dignity in dying. And therefore, it's very important that as politicians, we understand the human rights implications of issues. And certainly, you know, over a, a long period of time, people outside have been rather perplexed that the new Scottish Parliament, a very early democracy, could have passed a defence of justifiable assault. So um, I think you have to think about your reputation as well as the ability to do the right thing. Um, and I, I, would, I would definitely echo that. I would also say um, dealing with those difficult issues, that's what human rights is there for. That's what it's for. It's actually to deal with those difficult issues. It gives you a language and a framework to have those discussions and those debates. So rather than coming back to kind of what your sort of political, either with a capital or small p, um, or your own personal moral judgments are on those issues, that you're being guided by a framework which is bigger, which is actually a principled approach to how countries across the world are saying they want to progress and they want to, um, kind of, that, that those are the standards for society and for how we should work. Um, and it's really interesting, um, kind of, because, as you say, kind of creating political controversies and hot potatoes and the fear of, of actually doing the right thing and using human rights because... And that's what it might actually lead to. But on a day to day basis, that's what that's actually what I'm always talking to public officials about doing is actually when they're making a decision about to whether or not to turn off life support in a particular situation. Well, actually having a discussion about the right to life and then the right to respect for kind of private life and being able to make decisions, which ones are absolute and which ones can balance. That's a really useful, practical approach that those practitioners take to making really difficult day to day decisions. And there's no reason why the language shouldn't be translated into the political sphere and actually the people who are making the legislation and the policy should be using that language as well. I have almost nothing to add to that <laughs> discussion. Um, apart from to say that when you speak to people about what of their rights are important to them, they almost always talk about economic and social rights, which I think we mustn't lose sight of. So if you're talking about the things that make the most difference to people's daily lives, um, then they are economic and, and social rights. And we also know that actually, if you want to convince people to be positive and supportive of human rights, that's also what you have to talk about. You have to talk about the sort of daily experience. So I, I think it's important not to lose that. Um, so for example, one of the issues around incorporation is at the moment, economic and social rights, we don't have, we don't have a way of enforcing those, but with incorporation, there, there is that uh, potential. So. We've got about 10 minutes of questioning left, so I know, Gail, you want to come in with a quick supplementary, then I'm going to David. Yeah, thanks, Camina. Um, it's just something that came to me when, when um, Carl especially is, is really driving home the fact that we've got responsibilities already and that we should be, um, you know, public authorities should be exercising these rights. When somebody's human rights are violated, A, they might know about it, but B, how do they then access that judicial process if that's the way they want to go down? And is there any value? I mean, we've got equalities officers in local authorities and, and different places. Is there a value in persuading them to have human rights officers? So they can have twofold. They can um, they obviously have all the knowledge. So they can go to the officers and say, this is what you should be doing. But also a person, a one point of contact that people in the public can go to if they feel that their rights have been violated. I think that's an excellent suggestion, Gail. My, my plea would be, though, that the equality officer is someone different from the human rights officer. Because in my experience, um, there is a great deal of confusion because people think they are the same things. And certainly I've been at UN hearings where some of the expert committee members cannot understand the kind of UK culture around this because they say it's human rights first and then equality of those rights, whereas we go for equality and then we're sort of talking about human rights afterwards. And I think, um, you know, the history of even setting up this committee and the submissions that were made not to add human rights to equalities because it would allow less of a focus on equality shows that there is a bit of competition sometimes amongst some groups. So I do believe that it would be very helpful to have a human rights officer, you have an FOI officer, dash protection officer, 
I think that would generate a focus within authorities. It would build up expertise. And within organisations, where is the, the comfort of lots of private conversations, um, a lot of the myths can be debunked and systems can be put in place so that you don't have human rights issues arising in the first place because we really want prevention. We do not want a whole load of court cases because it gives human rights a bad name and it costs us all money. And it's often very torturous for the individuals involved going through the whole court process. And I often say to people, you're never going to get justice. The hope is you get some fairness. So I do not believe that court cases are actually very helpful. And that's why I think having a focus, an officer, a department, some resources within organisations is very much the way to go. And it is also very public evidence that you're taking human rights seriously. Thank you for convening. Good morning, panel. Um, in the Human Rights Consortium Scotland submission, um, and it's to do with committees and other committees, we all sit on them and how we uh, incorporate the human rights agenda. You've called for all committees when considering the legislation and policy should specifically consider its impact on human rights and seek evidence on this. How could we go about this within Parliament and on the different committees we sit in? Uh, so, um, mm. Our members discussed this when we were considering what evidence to put in, and some of the very practical suggestions were things like specifically having an evidence session within uh, the scrutiny of any piece of legislation that specifically looks at the human rights implications. Um, and also, there's an element of the uh, looking at the participation side. How have people's views been taken into account? How have the impacts been considered on different uh, groups uh, within society. Um, and I think as well, uh, some of the other suggestions that have already been discussed around human rights rapporteurs, for example, so somebody who's specifically considering that uh, within uh, each committee. Um, so I think the challenge is for each committee to really take on human rights aspects as a core part of what they do, when they're, whatever they're doing, whether it's an inquiry or whether they're, they're scrutinizing legislation. I think also, um, for, for each committee, there are particular um, inquiries or lines of questioning that they could look at around human rights. So, for example, it could be uh, the Justice Committee uh, ask Police Scotland what they're uh, doing to promote human rights and investigate specific aspects of their work. Um, so, for example, it could be Police Scotland's um, overseas work and their training and how do they consider human rights within that. So there is, I think as each committee develops their way of looking at human rights, then they can, they can identify um, specific areas to interrogate a little bit more. Do you think, do you think an equality impact assessment should be an equality impact and human rights impact assessment? So that the two things are done in the same way. And I'll tell you why um, I've got a thing about equality impact assessments and badly um, uh, completed ones at that. But when we did our inquiry last year on destitution for people with insecure asylum status, we, we heard evidence of people who would turn up at social work, they would put them through a social work needs assessment and then come back six weeks later to do a human rights impact assessment and it just seemed like an incredible waste of time and a big delay in realising the rights of this person who was in a crisis, so to wait six weeks or eight weeks or whatever for that to be done. And we made a recommendation then that actually these two things should be put together and done at the same time. Would, would, would that be another way that, that you know, the function of this place, uh, creating a duty on or, uh, duty bearers uh, in order to make sure that it's an equality impact assessment, but that equality impact assessment has a human rights impact assessment incorporated. What do you think? I think it's got a lot of merits, but I certainly I have seen one uh, where it was incredible that they said there were no human rights implications at all of what they were proposing. Um, so I think it has to be underpinned by training. And I also think there has to be better quality information gathered to in order the assessment to be worthwhile. Um, I've certainly worked with groups who have un tried to undertake them and the information hasn't really been there. And that's why looking at international treaties and looking at what they tell us about systems is really important. So the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities under Article 31, there's a duty to gather statistics and information to allow you to determine whether or not human rights are being progressed. And I think that needs to be actually more of a focus in Scotland, gathering the right information, the right data, so that you can not just undertake the impact assessment, but when the committee's deliberating, you have better, you've access to better information. <laughs> 
Thank you. David, you've got three minutes. Three minutes, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking of comments that have been there previously about my Brexit. Um, with it being less than a year away and with the UK leaving the EU, do you think human rights will continue to keep pace with EU and progress or will they stagnate and possibly be diluted? And the reason I'm saying this is because there's many reserve powers there still with Westminster, so no matter what work this committee does or this parliament will have no effect on it. And to give you an example, employment law. It is a fundamental threat to uh, the progression of rights in the future, and some of that is because it takes away uh, the framework that there has been in the EU, but also, uh, as was commented on earlier on, there is a risk that we lag behind. Um, and uh, certainly recently, there is a Scotland Declaration on Human Rights, which is a civil society. Organisations have signed up um, about more than 150 now to say that they don't want that to be the case, that they want rights to keep progressing and for us to keep a pace with um, the EU and, and what happens there. I mean, there's very specific issues at the moment around withdrawal bills and continuity bills. Um, but I think a really uh, helpful thing that the committee could do is to build into its work plan, making sure it keeps up with best practice internationally, and that's whether it is within the EU or, or broader, um, that if, if you generally want to be a leader in human rights terms, um, then that's what it means. It means making sure that there's uh, that you keep up with the the best practice and and keep uh, progressing on little bits of rights. So, um, I think also that unfortunately Brexit brings a kind of a weakening of a framework that means the threat of um, the repeal of the Human Rights Act or coming out of the ECHR is definitely more imminent. And I'm particularly concerned at the moment that if there is a uh, if there is no legislative consent, for example, to the EU withdrawal bill, that that sets up uh, an even stronger precedent for what happens in the future if we similarly have a repeal of the Human Rights Act bill and there is no legislative consent given in Scotland. I'm just putting that out there. That That is a, a concern that that um, uh, could potentially mean that Scotland has less say in the repeal of that. So we need to we need to continually bear that in mind that that is the, the background noise. But to keep progressing rights, I think, is the answer to that. To keep so for the parliament to have a, a determination and a, within your structures and the way you do your annual work plan to keep progressively realising rights is, is uh, the response. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I think there's two two points. One is kind of substance, and one is of principle. Principle. I mean, essentially, substantively, we are losing right. We're losing both rights and mechanisms to enforce them um, through Brexit. I mean, that's kind of it's really hard to argue with that because, you know, in fact, human rights are at the moment the thing that is being excluded from what we are going to carry forward. And then you've got the impact of what that means for all of the other. Um, the other protections that affect our rights as well. So you've got that question. You've then got what happens kind of moving apace. So much of our equalities legislation, for example, has been driven through membership of the EU. Um, and so now we're at a place where that won't be the driving force behind that. I mean, when kind of regulations were turned into equalities law, I mean, that it was the EU that was driving that process, and we're not going to have that impetus anymore. So there's a real kind of question about what rights are at stake, whether they're going to stagnate, and the extent to which actually we're going to fall behind in those developments. And I think there is definitely a huge role um, that could be played here in that, in terms of a progressive vision of human rights Kind of actually using um, using human rights in, across all of your functions um, and pushing pushing that agenda forward. But I think also it's the principled matter. It's that we're setting a really dangerous precedent that the UK is saying that we don't need to be bound by international standards, um, and that's not a positive place for us um, to be in. It's Brexit at the moment, but what will it be um, in the future? And then that's when it comes back to um, I think what Carol has, has particularly been saying around actually we need to focus on what we do have we need to focus on the laws that we do have the rights that we do have and actually implementing what we do have because if we're not creating that case for why what we have is really important when we're then saying well we don't know kind of how to to make this real against a backdrop of do we really need international standards that's going to come together in a really dangerous um, swell. So actually the focus on what we do have, making it real, implementing it, using the powers and functions that you do have to really drive forward why human rights is important and why developing a culture of respect for human rights in Scotland is particularly important, that creates a really important kind of backstop for what potentially might be coming. <laughs>
Um, I see Brexit as a human rights issue. I think it's an abomination, um, but I won't go into that just now. Um, Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, as I said earlier, is the right to form an opinion and to receive and impart information. People were misled by the information during the campaign. I cannot speak to the motivation of the people that uh, misled them, but I do think there has to be legal change to protect our other human right, which is the right to participate in free elections. Those elections have to be fair. And if politicians um, are deliberately misrepresenting the facts to secure people's votes, then just the same as advertisers and marketeers, they should be punished by the law. And I think that's the real learning from Brexit. And I think it's something usefully the committee could progress as a human rights issue. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a place to, to finish, but we are not, we're not at the end by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if we've exhausted all our questions this morning, I think we have so far, but the same uh, proviso we gave to the, the last uh, panel, no doubt we're going to talk about all of these issues as we continue with this inquiry. We've got some very clear lines where I think we're, 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 we're pursuing and, and some great ideas from all of the, the, the contributions, so, so no doubt we, we'll talk again. But we are grateful thanks to the committee for your participation this morning. You work so far and your continued work with us in order to realise the aims that, that, that we have as well. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to suspend committee to go into private. Okay? If you need a quick break, go now.